important thing is that you're able to see um, the documents I'm going to share. So if somebody doesn't see the document, please let me know, okay? And um, when, when she does share the documents, then we'll switch to the side, right? Okay, I'm muting myself. Are here. we ready? Yep. Okay. Okay, so hello everybody. My name is Erica Warner. Some of you guys already know me. If you are a tutor in my class or you have seen me around. Um, I have done this training for almost five times now, but this is the first time I'm doing this on Zoom. So it might not go as well, <laughs> but we'll still will try. And it might not be as fun as when we do it in person because it's very interactive in person. And now I'm just going to talk. So I'm sorry. It's going to be a little boring. But at the end, I want to save the last 30 minutes for questions. So please, if, if each one of you can at least come up with one question, that will be great uh, because I want to be able to talk with each one of you guys. So I'm going to try to go through this as fast as I can so we can have a lot of questions at the end. This uh, training, the citizenship training, I put together based on A, my own experience with the USCIS office, which is long because I have had every visa, green card interview, everything I have gone through myself. So that's my citizenship training is based on and also based on all of the experiences that I have had with my students. I have had um, in the four years I am, I have been at the learning lab. I think I have had almost 20 students get their citizenship already and I have gone through that process with them. So I already know a lot about that. And then finally, the main questions or the main points I'm addressing in this training is based on the questions I hear from my tutors all the time. So I feel like the questions are always the same. So that's the questions that I want to address. The citizenship process is long and complicated. So I try to simplify it as much as possible, okay? So I'm going to try to answer four questions today. Who gets to apply for citizenship. So I'm going to do this like I do my grammar lessons. W questions. Who applies for citizenship? What does the process look like? When can you apply? Where do you apply? How much does it cost? And how long does it take? And how does the interview look like? So at the end of the citizenship, I'm hoping that you can answer the who, what, when, where, and how. Those are my goals, okay? So I'm going to start sharing the documents right now and start answering each one of those W questions, okay? Please unmute yourself and say something if you cannot see the documents, okay? Okay. And Mary Jane, if you can please unmute yourself and tell me, Erica, we see it so I can start talking, okay? Okay. I see it. I Good. Okay, yeah. so the citizenship application. Let's start with the who. Who can apply for this citizenship? Mind you, not everybody can apply for citizenship citizenship. Only people that have come to the U.S. under certain circumstances can apply for citizenship. Okay, so when we arrive to the U.S., there are different ways to enter the U.S.A. You can either enter the country with a visa. There are many different kinds. There are B1, H1, J1, K1. There are so many different kinds. I'm not going to go through each one, but the, these ones are the most popular. So for example, I came into the country with a J-1 visa, which is, is called fiance visa, which means I was engaged to an American citizen. Other people come through the country with an H-1 visa, which is for work. Regardless, you always enter the USA with a visa. Our, the majority of our students actually don't come to the US with a visa. They come here with the refugee status, and so they come 
to the U.S. with what is called a Form I-94. It is a form that is attached to, the, to their passport, and that's the way that they enter the U.S. legally. So you either enter the country with a visa or you enter the country with a Form I-94. But those are the only two ways that you can later on apply for a green card. That's the street name. But the legal name is Form I-485. So in order to get this Form I-485, which is the green card, you have to have either a visa or a Form I-94, the refugee status. You cannot get a green card without one of these two, okay? Of course, through the years, they have done green cards for people that have been entered the country illegally and all these things, but that's a whole different issue. I'm, I'm going to only focus on the most typical cases. So you enter the country with your visa or your refugee status. Immediately after that, you apply for your green card, Form I-485. You get your green card, and when you have had your green card for five years or three years, if you are married to an American, like in my case, because I'm married to an American, I do not have to wait five years. I can apply for citizenship after three years. So either three years or five years, then you get to apply for citizenship with the form N-400, which is the form that our students submit and the form that we use in the classroom, the form N-400. Then after the form N-400, then you eventually, you will get your U.S. passport. Okay. Hey, Erica? So, yes. Sorry. Should we be taking a lot of notes or are you going to share some of these slides? I'm them? going to give you one single document at the end that has all of this information. So just write down whatever question comes to mind. And then at the end, I'm going to send you guys this one handout. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Okay. So who gets to apply? So who gets to apply? to citizenship, either a, a person that has entered the United States legally, either via visa or via refugee status, okay? Okay, so what does the process of applying for citizenship looks like? What does it look like? As I said, it's very long and I try to simplify it, okay? So, Everything starts with, have you had a permanent resident card for at least five years? Yes, then you can apply for citizenship, okay? So the first condition is time. You have had your permanent resident card for five years. Then you can apply. Once you have been here for five years, you fill and submit the form and 400. This form is a 20 page back and forth form, very complicated that you can A, fill out by yourself if you feel confident in your abilities, or you can hire a lawyer to do it for yourself, or maybe you can ask one of the different companies like IRC that have volunteers that can help you fill out this form. We as teachers of the learning lab and we as volunteers of the learning lab do not help fill this form because it's a legal form. It is, we are not attorneys. I mean, maybe some of you guys are, <laughs> but still it is beyond our responsibility. So we do not get involved in that just to be safe. we never want to make a mistake. And then the students have you know, blame us because of it. So we work with the N-400 form in the way that we help them practice for the interview using this form, or we can print the form for them, but we do not fill the form for them or help them fill the form in class. That's very important, okay? So this form N-400 is a 20-page form back and forth that also requires documentation and requires a fee. So it requires a lot of documents that the students have to put together. Documents, everything, 
all their visa forms, their social security copies, green card copies, passport copies, birth certificates, the list is very long. I don't want to bore you, but you have to put together a lot of documents and then you have to come with the fee, okay? So let me just touch on the fee pretty quick. How much is that fee? So it is $640 and then 85 extra dollars for the biometrics, which is when they, biometrics is when they, uh, you have to go and get your fingerprints. So they send it to the FBI to make sure that you don't have a criminal background. And that costs $85, you have to pay for that. And then the actual form costs $640. So the total comes to $725. Does everybody need to pay this? No. Some people might qualify for what is called, again, form I-912 <laughs> is a fee waiver. You can apply for this form if you, A, have benefits like social security, or you are below the 150% poverty level, or sometimes even if you have an, a financial hardship, like you have maybe uh, the one that is most used is if you have medical bills uh, that are very high, then you can apply. But mostly if our students are from social security, they can apply for this fee waiver. So the majority of our students do qualify for this fee waiver. Um, and they apply for it and then you submit this application with your citizenship application or you send your check like in my case i do not qualify for these things so i have to send a check with the application okay if this is 640 dollars and uh it's going up to 1200 dollars this year so hopefully everybody apply before the fees go up. So you send your form that you fill by yourself or with a lawyer or with a qualified person and you send your form with your documents with your fee. Once you send this form, this is when all the waiting game begins. The wait is long, okay? First, you have to wait for the application just to be accepted. This means you wait for the application to just be received at the USCIS office. This takes around two weeks. So you send your application, then you wait two weeks, you get a notification that says your application has been accepted. This is when your check gets cashed, okay? If your check gets uh, cashed, this is a good sign. So every time that <laughs> you see that they accepted the money, this is good because it means they have this application in their hands and they can start reviewing this application. After the application gets accepted, now you have to wait again for the biometrics appointment, which is the first step. This takes around five weeks. Again, I'm working on average waiting time. For some people, it takes longer. For some people, it takes shorter time. Also depends on the state. Luckily for us in Idaho, it's fast because they don't have such a big load in applications, like for example, the state of New York or Florida. So here in Idaho, they actually move very fast and that's good for us. So you wait for the biometrics appointment. It takes around five weeks after you send your application. They send you everything, every communication from the USCIS is done via letter in the mail. You get a letter that says we receive your application, then you, you get a letter that says, please go to get your biometrics taken at your local office, okay? So you appear at the USCIS local office for the my biometrics appointment. Now let's talk about the where. <laughs> so where is the USCIS application sent? And where do you go for your biometrics and your interview? There are two different places. 
The first place is the actual big USAIS office. It is divided by state. So if you live, I'm sorry guys, I know this is complicated. Don't worry, I'm not gonna test you about all of this. So if you live in any of these states, like us, we live in the state of Idaho, we send an application to the US, USCIS office in Arizona. And this is very important that we send the application to the correct, to the correct address. So I have had a couple of students that send their application to Texas or Florida because they didn't read these well enough. So just for example, me, I always remember, I belong to Arizona. Just if they ever ask me, I always make sure, did you send it to Arizona? Then don't worry about it. So this is the application. We send it to the big USCIS office, which is in Arizona. But the USCIS local office here in Boise, Idaho, is the one that takes our biometrics and does our interview. Where is this office? I'm sorry, this one I don't have um, a document. I forgot, I'm sorry. But this office is close to the Walmart in Overland. It is very, um, is very right next to Fish and Game or the Social Security office. If any of you guys are interested, I can give you the exact address or you can Google it, USCIS local office, okay? Anyway, that's where you go for your biometrics. You go to the USCIS local office for your biometrics appointment. This is the day that you, they take a picture of you and they take your fingerprints. A lot of uh, typical question that you might get from the students is, are they gonna ask me the questions this day? No, they do not. It is a very fast appointment. It takes 10 minutes. You enter, they take a picture, they take your fingerprints, you're out of there. It's very quick. This day, nothing happens. A lot of things that happens with our students is when they get this biometrics appointment, they get very excited and they think that their citizenship is around the corner and it's not. So after the biometrics, this is when you have to wait the longest time, approximately uh, eight weeks, but that's the shortest amount of time. Now you have to wait uh, for the appointment notice for the naturalization interview, six months minimum to one year max. So after you take the biometrics appointment, this is when you have to wait the longest time. Some of our students, I don't know if you know our student Tatiana, got her citizenship interview in two months after she sent the naturalization application. That was, wow, amazing. Another student of mine waited for 18 months. So it really is very difficult. I do not know if they base it on um, country or maybe if you are married to American or not, family numbers. Honestly, I don't know, no. I don't know what their, their criteria is. All I know is that every single one, one of my students have had a different waiting time. But I will say the average is six months. Now, right now, <laughs> everything is different because all of a sudden we have this pandemic and now times are of course longer. I have two students that were waiting for their interview in April. They were of course canceled and we do not know what is going to happen. But in normal life, six months is the average. Uh, Mary Jane, do you have any questions? No, I think it it's very clear. Okay, so can I keep talking? There is just a lot of information ahead. Yes. Okay, good. So we sent the application, we waited for the biometrics, now we're waiting for the interview, and we keep waiting, and then finally the day comes that you get the letter that says, go to your local office for your naturalization interview. This is the big day. This is the day we have been waiting for, for some people, a long time, one year. And now 
remember, we have been waiting for one year for the naturalization interview, but we actually have been waiting for five years since the very first time we arrived into the country. So we have been waiting for this moment for a long time. So our students are A, either very excited or B, very, very anxious. <laughs> so I will say, this is just a personal um, recommendation. Our students tend to know the 100 questions back and forth very well. I feel like they are excellent at this. I will say 50% of our job is to teach them the material, but then the other 50% is actually encourage them and like cheer them on and try to like calm their nerves. I have had students telling me, I cannot sleep, I can't eat, <laughs> just waiting for this day. So I, my, a lot of my job is just like, you know it, you are gonna be fine, you are going to do great. And honestly, I don't feel like I have to tell you guys, you already do this, excellent, you already do this, but sometimes our students need this extra kind of like cheerleader, which I am, Honestly, I love doing that. It's like, you can do it. You're great. Oh my God, you're the best citizenship interviewer they have ever had. Those are the kind of things that I say. And they love that because they need it. I am doing this. For example, I'm giving you this training. I speak English. I have an American family. But still, every time I have to go to the USCIS office, my knees tremble and my mouth is dried, and my heart, and I'm sweating. Like, it doesn't matter, seriously. It's just a very intimidating. It is not because they're mean. They're not mean. They're very polite people, and they're great people. I have had great experiences with USCIS. It is just, it's for some reason, when you are an immigrant, it's a very tender, I don't know, you just get nervous. So our students really need a lot of encouraging that they're going to be fine. And I will say that's very important when we have a student that is going to have their citizenship interview that we do a lot of encouragement as well as the actual history and civics and government material, okay? So the big day is here. We cover how much it costs. We cover the where. We go to the USCIS office locally. Now, we are at the USCIS local office for the interview. We are going to have the big test that day. This is the big day that we have been studying for in class. This is the day that we will have the 100 questions. After we pass the test, we have to go back again for the ceremony. The ceremony, this is when you attend the oath of allegiance. This is the time that they swear loyalty to the United States. It's a beautiful ceremony. And then this is the day that they give you your certificate of naturalization that is like this document that looks like a diploma with the American flag and your picture is beautiful. People frame it in their homes. It's a big deal. And then when you have this naturalization certificate, that's when you can apply for a U.S. passport, not before. You need to have the certificate in order to go to the post office or wherever you're going and apply for your U.S. passport. Without this document, you cannot apply for your passport, okay? And then, finally, the interview, I will say, is the most important part of the process and this is the one to focus on the most because it's the one part that we prepare our students for okay so this is the number one question that students have asked me in my time as a teacher is how does the interview looks like what is it going to happen for some reason, it gives them security and confidence to know exactly everything that is going to happen. So I always tell them everything from the beginning, and this works very well. So they tell me, teacher, what is going to happen on the interview? And I say, okay, gonna wake up in the morning after a night of not sleeping, probably. <laughs> they always say that's true. 
you wake up in the morning, make sure that you eat well because you do not want to go there being hungry. Make sure that you hit the restroom. Make sure that you arrive on time, extra early. You do not want to be dealing with traffic on your way to this interview. They already do that, present them, themselves like an hour before. But I give them advice since the very beginning of the day. Wake up early, wear professional clothes. Hey, can you, another question they ask me is, can I wear my typical clothes for my country? Yes, of course, you can. Just look, look, you know, semi-professional. Go early, take all of your documents with you. Take everything. Even if you think that you're not going to need it, one time I went to my interview and they asked me for my marriage certificate and I didn't have it and they canceled my interview. So take everything. It's better to have more stuff than to have the, your day being ruined. So take your passports, take your children's passports, take your social security, take everything. Make a little folder with all of your documents and take it with you. Very important is you have to take your interview letter because when you enter USCIS, the security guards ask you for your letter. Otherwise, they wouldn't even let you in. So prepare your documents, prepare your letter, go to the USCIS office. Okay. Once you enter, you sit down in the waiting room, and then they will open this door. You are sitting there. You're sweating. You're nervous. They open the door, and they yell your last name. So they open the door, Warner, and then, you know, <laughs> your heart <laughs> skips a bit. Then they will take you to this room. You go there by yourself. No translator, of course. No family members, no nobody. Just you and the USAIS immigration officer. You sit in this nice office. They always start with um, some small conversation. I always tell the students that they will ask them this small conversation because they always think that they're going to get straight to, who is the father of our country? It doesn't happen like that. First, they tell them, how are you? How is your drive? Isn't it a nice day? So it's also good to practice small talk with our students. I spend a lot of time doing that small talk practice with them so they can feel comfortable at that part of the interview too. Then the USCIS officer will ask them, okay, are you ready? Yes, I am. They start by telling you, can you please stand up, raise your hand, do you promise to tell the truth, but nothing but the truth? Yes. So that it's very important that our students know that they also gonna get asked this question. Again, our goal is that our students are never surprised by a question so because if they get surprised then they get they freeze <laughs> and we do not want that so i try to tell them everything that is going to happen do you promise to tell the truth yes okay sit down now they tell you i'm going to ask you this some personal questions these personal questions are based on the questions that they already answered in their original form. The USCIS immigration officer has this form in front of them. They have the form with all of your information, all of your life in front of them. Now, they're going to ask you the exact same questions. Why? Because they want to verify that what you're saying here in real life is the same stuff that you wrote down on your application. So of course you are not lying, of course you are not you know, changing anything. So it is very important that you also know the answers to all of this. Now, what kind of personal questions are they asking you? They ask you things like, what's your name, date of birth, uh, when did you become a permanent resident, social security number, all of these things. Okay. Now, they do not ask you this question in an easy way. They don't ask you what's your name. They ask you in very formal USCIS way. Okay. I'm going to show you an example. You're going to see me now. 
Hello, everybody. So I want to show you an example of the kind of uh, kind of words they use because again, it's not stuff that our students are used to. Okay, so let me show you an example of how they ask these questions. One second. So we could just ask, "What's your name?" But what they do is things like this. Hold on. One second. Okay, so these are the kind of questions that they will ask you. What is your name? When is your birthday? Where were you born? When did you become a permanent resident? How many times have you left the United States? How tall are you? How much do you weigh? How many times have you been married? So these questions are very important. So it's very important that we also practice these kind of personal questions with our students. This is the easy way that they ask. I just do it this way to practice. But the way that they talk is, can you please state your first name and last name? Can you please state your birthday? Can you please state, so they talk like this, like state this and state that. So I, I try to teach our students these kind of verbs um, just for them to be ready. But if they can just learn the regular way, that works too. What's your name? What's your birthday? Where were you born? All of these kind of personal questions. Then after they ask you all of these personal questions, they're going to ask you, all the other personal questions that you fill in your form. This is what we call no questions. So they're going to ask you these very uncomfortable questions and you are going to say no to all of them, okay? Examples, have you ever, filed, uh, have you ever failed to file your taxes? No. Uh, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? No. Have you ever been a member of a terrorist organization? No. Have you ever been arrested? No. Have you ever been convicted? No. <laughs> so all of these questions we practice with them and see the right answer is no, okay? Sometimes the students want to get complicated, like, well, what about if it's yes? And I say, okay, it doesn't matter if it's yes or no. What it matters is, what you answered in your form. If you said no in your form, you said no in your interview. I hope that makes sense. And if you have questions about this later, please let me know. So all of these are more no questions. Uh, have you been in, in prison? Have you ever been a prostitute? Have you ever uh, sold drugs? Have you ever gambled? These kind of questions. It's very important that we also practice these questions with the students so they are not surprised. Do we have access to these questions? Yes, because they are the exact questions that are on the N400 form. So if you guys ever want to take a look in detail to these questions, all you have to do is download the N400 form, which is public information on the internet at the USCIS website. Or I can give you a copy, I can send it to your email if you're curious, okay? After all of these no questions, there are 32, now they come the yes questions, which are, do you support the Constitution and the government of the United States? Yes, of course. Do you understand the oath of allegiance? Yes. Do they understand it? Yes, because we try to spend some time showing to them the actual text of the Oath of Allegiance so they understand what it is and what it says. Some of our students ask me, do I have to memorize this Oath of Allegiance? No, you don't. When we go to the ceremony, the, there is a screen in front of you and the Oath of Allegiance is right there for you to repeat. 
if you want to memorize it, that's great, but you're not going to be tested on this. You're just going to have to say that your ceremony, but it's in front of you in a screen, okay? Are you willing to take the full oath of allegiance? Yes, because the ceremony is all about you standing up, saying the oath of allegiance, okay? Then, this is a, a complicated question. If the law requires this, are you willing to bear arms on behalf of the United States? You should say yes. Now, it says here, no. You can use religious background for a no answer. Now, if you do that, you have to provide documents and statements that honestly, I do not have all that information available. I have never had a student that wants to say no to this. So we always, normally all, all my students, we have just said yes. Then uh, they ask you, if the law requires this, are you willing to perform services in the USA Armed Forces? Yes, and if the law requires this, are you willing to perform work of national importance under civilian direction? Then you say yes. Again, you do not have to say yes, but if you, this is my personal, again, personal opinion again. If you want to get citizenship, you have to say yes, okay? Um, again, this is all based, you already answered all of these questions in your form that you submitted. Now you just making sure that you're saying the same answers again. I hope this makes sense. Um, hi. Mary Jane, are we making sense? Yes. Does anybody um, have questions at this point? Oh, hi, Don. I didn't know that Don had joined us. Now yeah, I got lost. <laughs> well, welcome. Welcome. Don't worry. Uh, and, and again, I will, I will save in all the questions for, I'm almost done. I told you I will just talk and talk and talk for a long time. I'm sorry, it's not my fault. <laughs> it's the form fault because it's a long form, okay? So we are sitting down in front of the officer. He asked us all of this personal information, the yes and no questions. We answer all of that. Now comes the fun part. Are you ready for your civics test? Yes, I studied so hard for a long time. I know the 100 questions. Okay, good. They are going to ask you 10 questions, not 100, 10. 10 random questions, whatever they want, whatever they want from the 100 questions. I think they always tend to ask the same kind of questions, but we still have to memorize all 100, just in case. They ask you 10 questions, you answer six correct, you pass the test. So I will say very easy, okay? 10 questions. What kind of questions? I think you guys are very familiar with these um, 100 questions, but I'm going to ask you six today okay if you know and you are very fast and mute yourself and yell the question okay the answer is a competition are you ready okay i'm going to ask you the questions and you're going to yell your answer wait so everyone we want to make sure you're unmuted so yeah. unmute yourself everybody yeah, I don't know how to do that i'm going to do it for you right now and mute yourself so you can win. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm going to ask 10. You're going to give me the answers. Are you ready? Ready. Yes. <laughs> All right. We hope. <laughs> we hope. Okay, everybody, question number one. What is the supreme law of the land? Constitution. 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 Uh, correct. What does the Constitution do? Sets up government. Good job. What else? Guarantees rights. 
Okay, what else? Finds the powers for the different branches. Okay, well, the correct answer, and you have to say all of these things, sets up the government, defines the government, protects the basic rights of Americans. Typical question from the students. Do I have to say all three of them? Yes, you do. The idea of self-government is in the first three words of the Constitution, which are people. We the people. We the people. <laughs> what is an amendment? An addition. A change. Good. You say both. A change or an addition. You have to say both. Good job. What do we call the first ten amendments? Bill of Rights. Good job. What is one right from the First Amendment? Speech. Speech. Good. In this case, when they highlight this, when they say what is one, then you can only say one. And you can pick one. Speech, religion, press. The students can pick one and memorize one. Now, our students are awesome. They like to memorize all of them. That's good. How many amendments? 27. Yes, good job. <laughs> what did the Declaration of Independence do? Independence from England. From Great Britain. Good. Announced their independence from Great Britain, declared our independence, said that the United States is free. This is the three ways all correct to answer this question. Okay. Okay, almost done. What are two rights in the Declaration of Independence? Liberty, pursuit of happiness. <laughs> Let's see. Good job. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Our students love this one, the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> Last question. What is freedom of religion? Be able to worship where when you want to. <laughs> or not to worship if you choose. Yes. yes. Whoever said that one. You, yeah, you can worship or not. Good job. You can practice any religion or not practice. Okay, so those are 10. You guys want me to test you the other 90? <laughs> no. no, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so they will ask you 10. You answer six correct. Good. Now they will ask you, do you know how to speak English? <laughs> Hopefully. Yes. You said yes. Then they will say, okay, can you read in here? You said yes, of course. Then they will give you sentences to read in English. My students asked me, what kind of sentences? Like random things, they're not going to have you read things like the cow gives milk. No, they're all sentences related to citizenship. So sentences like George Washington was the father of our country, Independence Day is in July, those kind of sentences. Nowadays, they give you these sentences in an iPad. And I tell the students that because they expect to see flashcards, like the ones we use in class, or they expect to see paper, but actually starting, I, I don't remember when exactly, but now they give you a sentence in an iPad and you have to read the sentence from this iPad. So I tell the students expect to see an iPad, okay. Then they will tell you, do you know how to write in English? You say yes. This is why we practice dictation over and over again with our students to make sure that their spelling and capitalization and punctuation is correct because they do care about that. Spelling is very important and the capitalization of proper names, Washington, months, July, Lincoln, very important that these important names are written correctly. Again, they will tell you three sentences. You have to write them down on an iPad. So they will give you an iPad and one of those little pens, like the ones you sign a credit card, and then you will write it down on the iPad. 
our students get a little nervous about this because they sometimes they think that they have to type on a keyboard for the sentences, but you do not, okay? You just either, you write on paper with a pen, or if they have an iPad, you write on an iPad with one of those electronic pens. Does that make sense? Okay. So you answer the questions, you read the sentences, you write the sentences. Here in Boise, they will tell you right there on the spot if you pass your citizenship. Some states don't do that. Some states let you go and then send you a letter saying that you passed or you didn't pass, which I think is so cruel <laughs> to like leave that day without knowing. But here in Boise, they tell you that. Um, they tell you, congratulations, you passed. You're a citizen now. And then they will send you a letter that says, congratulations, you passed. And in this letter, they will tell you the date for your ceremony. Normally, is two weeks after your interview. So if one of our students ever pass their citizenship interview, expect to have the ceremony two weeks after. They're always on a Thursday in Boise. I don't know why. I can never go because it's always on a Thursday morning when I have class. Um, always at 10 a.m. and I would recommend, this is just personal preference, that if you want to attend a student's ceremony, you ask them first. Uh, sometimes they always 99.9 .9 are going to say, yes, please. But I had, I had one student that didn't want us to go. Uh, I don't know why, but so I would recommend that we ask them can I please uh, come to your ceremony? Many times they come and they say, please come, but uh, we should ask if they invite us. It's a very personal and emotional thing for some of them. So I think we should ask if we can go, okay? They always say yes, we go to the ceremony. It is uh, long <laughs> and it's not just our student, the one that is going to be celebrated. It's normally our student together with another 40 to 45 people from everywhere. So if you want to go, just be ready to stand up because <laughs> there are not enough chairs and to be there for an hour, an hour and a half. Okay, it's beautiful. They get their citizenship um, certificate that day. And it's very important that when you receive your certificate, you make sure that your name spelled correctly because now this is the name for the rest of your life as an American. And people have made mistakes. So from now on, I'll be Erica with a C and I do not want that because it's Erica with a K. So we need to make sure that in the certificate is written properly. And if there is a mistake, you can only fix it that one day, that day. You cannot get your certificate and then, oh, a week later, no. That day, you read it and there is a mistake, they will fix it that day. And then after this, you can apply for your passport and of course, register to vote that same day right there. They are awesome. They tend to have tables right there where you can just register to vote right away. But no, you cannot apply for your passport at the USCIS office. You have to go by yourself to the post office, whatever later on, okay? Any time later, okay. I will say that is all I have. So let me think. Yeah, they get your certificate, they get their passport. Now they can start traveling, going to their home countries, which is always happy and awesome. I will also recommend to the students that uh, some of them have done that, do not buy a ticket to go home until <laughs> you get your certificate and until after you apply for your passport. Uh, a lot of people like me, we think that the passport is given on the same day because in our home countries, that's the case. In Spain, I go to the office and they give me a passport in five minutes. Here, it takes up to eight weeks and sometimes our students don't know that. So do not buy tickets to go home until after you have your passport. That's another thing 
I tell my students, okay? So, uh, that is all. Now we can go at all of our questions, which I really hope you guys all have questions. I have one. Okay, who are you? I am Marie. So Why Erica hi, Marie. can't see us. She's using her cell phone instead of a computer. Oh, no. oh. So oh thank you. So you know. Now that I'm not sharing my document, I can see everybody. Oh, so okay, Marie, good. Okay, Marie good. Whitworth, I can see you. Okay, so what happens if I don't pass the test that day? How long do I have to wait to go through the whole process again? Good question. So if you do not pass the test, search on part of the test. So the test has the questions, the written part, and the reading part. If you fail one part, you only have to repeat this one oh. part. So if you, if you pass the questions, but then you didn't pass the spelling, you, will, you can come back just for the spelling. They will give you an appointment for uh, on average six weeks later. Okay. Now, I will say that people should, should be so ready that they should go, that they are 100% ready that they're going to pass. Uh -huh. And you can only repeat the test, um, you know, like, I believe only two times, I will have to double check, but you cannot take the test over and over and over again. So when you go for it, you should pass. Yeah. Okay. Eric, can I just want to ask everybody, is it okay if I take a photo? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that a okay? real face or just a picture? Well, <laughs> it, it, won't, it won't actually turn out very well, so we won't be able to see ourselves. But Jen asked me for a photo. I just want to do that before I forget. Okay. <laughs> Could you do a screenshot? Turn yourself back on. Oh, yeah. How do I do a screenshot? There you I go. Can do a screenshot, but only four people come up. So, so I have Mary Jane, Cheryl, and oh, wait, this Keely. Where are my screen? I got it better. But how do I take a screenshot with my computer? Does anyone oh, know how to do that? <laughs> are you on an Win iPad? Windows Shift S. Yes. Oh, yeah, Windows, Windows yeah. Shift S will give you an automatic snapshot. Okay, here we go. Let me find the window key. <laughs> Lower right. left. I got it. Shift wow. S. Okay, here. Draw a shape to create a snip. What? <laughs> Wait, let me just draw my shape here. <laughs> you just want a rectangular yeah, shape. Yeah, I'm doing want. it. Oh, wait, it didn't do it. Wait. Wait. Wow. You could tell I'm the technical guru at Learning Lab. <laughs> you have an open mind. You can Control learn. Control Shift S, right? That, that's it. it. Windows Shift S. Windows oh, I Shift mean S. Windows Shift S. There we go. Yeah. Okay, now I'm doing it again. Next training is on Zoom screens. Yeah, someone else, if you can, do it because every time I do it, it's only doing half of the screen. You want me to do it? Sure. Thank okay. you, Don. I got the whole screen right there. Oh, wait, Eddie Man is not showing up, but I got everybody else. Yeah, I got. You yeah, ready? finally, I did it too. Okay. Okay, you got it. Thank you. De nada, señora. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. I have a question. I'm Kitty. Hi, Kitty. Um, hi. Are there travel restrictions during this whole process and what are they? Very important. Every time you apply for any document with USCIS, you should not travel the entire time that the process is going through. So when you apply for your green card, do not, you cannot. Actually, it's, it is a stipulation that while you are applying for your green card, you are not allowed to leave your country to leave the U.S. When you, yes, after you get your green card, you can travel, it's okay, but every time you start a process with USCIS, you cannot travel. Why? Because you never know when they're going to send you the letter for the biometrics or for the interview, and they do not reschedule. Mm -hmm. So if you miss your interview, 
you have to start from the very beginning again. Ah. So do not travel <laughs> if you apply for anything. Once you submit your application, because you're, you're waiting for your biometrics or your affirmation or your interview, you really can't travel until you get your citizenship. Correct. Because you don't know. It can be two months. It can be eight months. And what about if you happen to be outside of the country when you get this letter? Now, the good news is every time you get a letter for an appointment, it's always two weeks out. So if you happen to be outside of the country and they send you a letter and you have somebody that opens this letter at home, you still have two weeks. So they send me a letter today, but my interview is not going to be tomorrow. It's going to be normally two weeks from now. They give you a, a window of two weeks. Thanks. Okay. Question? Erica, how do they handle children who may not have learned punctuation and spelling in any language? That's a great idea. Children, uh, that's a great question. Children don't have to do this. So yes. if you get a citizenship, you automatically, you, all your children under the age of 18 years old become citizens. Oh, cool. Okay. So children don't have to do it. So all moms, all of our moms that have become citizens, their children become citizens oh, cool. through them as long as they are under 18 years old. So very important, mom, please <laughs> apply for citizenship before I turn 18 so I don't have to do this. Hmm. Anyone else? This is, this is Jan, just a little question. Um, that oath requirements and all the answers were no. One of the questions was, have you ever served in the U.S. Armed Forces? Why would you have to answer no to that? No, no, no. You, you don't have to say no. You have to say what you answered that it is for you. So normally it's no. And those, that's like the average example, but some people have actually serve in the Air Force, then you say yes. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? That. Normally you will say no. The majority of people will say no. So we yeah. always give an example. But if it is a yes for you, there is nothing wrong okay. if you have to say yes. It's yeah. just that you have to answer what you answer in right. your situation. Yeah. Mary yeah. Jane, Chip your email please. Oh good. Any other questions, guys? So, Erica. Who is this? This is Bill. Hi, Bill. <laughs> I want to find your thing. Okay. Okay. Um, so, theirs have to write there. They have to write on an iPad at one point in this process. Yes. Um, have you uh, given your students an opportunity to work with an iPad? Has that been a real strange? Uh, thing for someone who hasn't done that? So the iPad process only started like around six months ago. So before that, we were always uh, practicing on paper. And when the iPad started, I have practiced with a couple of students in iPads that tutors have brought. Like I do not have an iPad in class, but I feel like it will be a good idea if we have a student that is applying for this in the future that we can practice with iPads to show them. Because for example, some of our older students, for example, may not be as comfortable. I had one student that a tutor offered to bring her iPad so we could practice with an iPad. But honestly, I do not have, Mayjane, do you have an iPad? I don't have an iPad, but we have one for the learning lab that we can use, right? Sure. Um, we don't have iPads, but we have some tablets. Yeah. yeah, which would be similar. But I don't think we have like a, is it called a stylus? Yeah. So maybe that's something Learning Lab should invest in. That is something that maybe at least one for practice, that is a very good idea. It's just that I these can't write are with it. I know <laughs> I can't write my name with those things. So that probably would be a good idea. Yeah, because they do get very nervous about the iPad thing for some reason. I don't know why. But this is very new. So we still starting is i think started six months ago yeah 
Thanks, Erica. Could a student request to do it with paper and pencil? Or would that be a big no-no? You know, I think you could. I don't know. It's just like the whole request thing, like, it's kind of like they are the boss and you okay. do what you mean. <laughs> but I think, honestly, I don't know. I don't know if you could request. You can <laughs> request uh, from them other things. You can request, for example, uh, some of our students think that they cannot request that a question be repeated, but you actually can. You can ask the officer, can you please repeat that question again? I'm going to ask about if you can request pen and paper. I think no, because I feel like they have their procedures and standards and you just have to abide by them. Mm -hmm. I have another question. It's Kitty again. Hi, Kitty. I work, um, people who have applied in Napa, it's a little different process because it's through Catholic Charities. I have a class to prepare mm -hmm. people. Um, I'm wondering, I mean, obviously most of those people in Napa have come in mostly illegally, but they have green cards. Is that because they've been here for a long time? Is that how they get the process of citizenship? And my other question is, because there are ratios for each country, once they pass, is it possible they have to wait for a long time to, um, because of the quota system? Wait for a long time for what? To actually become a citizen because only so many people from Mexico can become a citizen each year. Mm -mm. So the, the ratio for, so for example, for residents, there is a maximum amount of number per year that certain people can, uh, you can give certain amount of green cards per year. There is a max for that. Now for citizenship, there isn't because every anybody as long as you have all the requirements you can apply for citizenship and the only way to apply for citizenship is through a green card and right. i do not think this i don't know kitty i do not think that your uh, nationality plays a role in this because if you have your green card, it doesn't matter where you're from. That's the only thing that matters is you have the green card for five years and then you start the process. I think that the wait time is not based on nationality. It is based on the workload that the local office has. Okay, thanks. That's a great answer. Yes. And Catholic charities, I love them, Kitty. So if a student ever, by the way, if a student ever asks you for help, to fill the form, we say no, but we can direct them to people that help. And the teachers, we have that information. So you can ask like, hey Erica, this person needs, or Mary Jane, or this person needs somebody to help them. We can't, where can they go? And we have a list of different nonprofits that help with filling in Catholic Charities of Idaho is one of them and they're great. All right, okay, good. New questions? We have still 20 minutes. You good? Yeah. Good job. Okay, so if you don't have questions, I, I will ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> no questions? Can I ask you questions? Sure. Oh, sure. Okay. So now I'm going to ask you the five questions that I said were the most important things that I wanted you guys to get out of this. Okay, so I'm going to select names and ask you the questions. Oh, no. <laughs> Hello. So, Chuck, hi. Oh, How are hi. you? Good. Good. Do you remember? How much does it cost, the citizenship application? It's $640 plus $85 for the biometrics. But you mentioned that it was going to go up to uh, $1,200, and I didn't get when, when that date was. Yeah, this year it was going to go up, but now everything's on hold. Very good. Chad, you get, you get to go. <laughs> good. Okay. Okay, <laughs> next question. Let me see my other screen. I see a Maya uh, Maggie. Yes. 
who can apply for citizenship? Um, you can apply for citizenship if you have been, had a green card and been a resident for five years. Excellent. Or if you're married to an American citizen, for how many years? years? Three years. Perfect. So only people with green cards. Excellent, Maggie. Can Let's I see. I think, Erica, yes. So, so the refugee status factors in there somehow too, or do all refugees have a green card? Yes, that's a great question, Cheryl. So all people that come here with a refugee status automatically qualify for the green card. As a matter of fact, they get the green card very fast, faster than people like me. Who came here with a visa oh. so it took me a long time to get my green card um, but for refugee status they qualify right away so when they come here pretty much within the next week we can go with their form to the USCIS office and apply for the green card right away and that enables them to work and that enables them to work and have a social security number and do everything and pay taxes. <laughs> and pay taxes, of course. Yep. Mm -hmm. Erica, do you know if they come here on political asylum, is it a five year waiting period like refugee status? So the, the important thing, the five waiting period doesn't start when you enter the country, it starts when you become yeah. a resident. So first you enter the country either with political asylum or refugee status and you apply for your green card. Political asylum also qualifies for green card. And then the clock starts running when you get that green card. And um, so the only exception to the five year rule is if you're married to an American citizen. Yes. Right. So for example, me, I'm married to an American citizen. So I entered, my green card was given to me in 2015, in October 1st, 2015, which means October 1st, 2000, what? Can I do math? 18. <laughs> I can apply for a green card starting October 1st, 2018. But I haven't, uh, sorry, a citizenship, but I haven't yet. Because it's hard to... <laughs> you know, surrender your own citizenship. So, but I can apply anytime I want now. I'm still waiting. I need to learn the 100 questions. I need help. <laughs> <laughs> so, Eric, okay, so one more question for you or you have a question for me? I did. So when you say you can apply anytime, is there a time limit? Does it ever run out? Did they say, you know? No. No, and I do not have to apply. I can live forever on a green card. Okay. The only issue is green cards expire. Mm. So. And every time I renew my green card, I have to pay hundreds of dollars, right? How, how often does that happen? The first time, two years. Then, five years. Mm. Then finally, you get what is called a 10 year green card, which is awesome. And then 10 years, every 10 years. So right now I finally have a 10 year green card, which is awesome. So I don't have to apply for a green card again until 2028. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. And then again, for every 10 years forever, I do not, you do not have to become a citizen. It's just that it's better for you in terms yeah. of money, rights, voting, but you don't have to if you don't want to. Okay. Also, at any time, USCIS can deny my um, application at any time they want, if I do anything wrong. If I get a DUI, for example, oh, wow. <laughs> I promise I won't, but if I get a DUI, I cannot apply. They wouldn't renew my green card again. Wow. So, by so no happy hour for me. By retaining your citizenship, how does that affect your children? Do they have dual citizenship or your child? Sorry. So my, in, in my case, you can get citizenship either by, like 
there are three ways to get American citizenship by birth, like you guys, yeah. by naturalization yeah. or by your parents. Right. Yeah. So even if my baby had been born in Spain mm -hmm. because his dad is American, mm -hmm. I could have applied for his passport at the American embassy in Spain. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my child automatically has his American citizenship, which he right. has right now because we apply for a passport, but he also gets his Spanish citizenship. Now I do not have any documents because I have to go to the embassy and apply and you know, we cannot travel right now. <laughs> <laughs> What's the yeah. hurry? Children get dual citizenship through their parents. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, can I ask you the other two questions? Okay, so I'm going to ask, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, uh. Betty. Yes. <laughs> question for you. Where do you send your N-400 application? Um, if you live in Idaho, you would send it to Arizona. Excellent. Yes. Very good answer. Perfect. You passed. <laughs> <laughs> Molly, hi Molly. Hi, Molly Harhoff. Question for you: How many questions do they ask you from the 100 questions? Yeah, yeah. Or and six. how many? You get six right, then you're done. You get six right. Good, good. Mary Jane, question for you: <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. Okay, I'm going to ask you a, the most difficult one I can think of, okay? Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a month. <laughs> All right. So let me see, just one question. Let me think, let me think. A difficult one. <laughs> okay, yes. I'm nervous. Uh, tell me about the average waiting time since you get your biometrics until your naturalization interview is. Ah, uh, is it two months? Two months. Uh, yeah. It ha from the biometrics until you have your interview. Three years. Mm -hmm. Is it about two months? No, six months to a year. Six months to a year. year. Oh, you you had one student that got it in two yeah, months. All right. Okay. And she had one student. That I have had lots of students months. that have gotten it in two and three months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was saying is Idaho is going two months to three months because the load is low is so low, but on average it is six months. But here in Idaho, it takes so fast. However, sometimes our students say, I've been waiting for six months and they get very nervous and they don't and I say, Well, that's the average time. So yeah. they sometimes they think that if they have been waiting for a long time, something's wrong. But there is nothing wrong. And if there is something wrong, they will send you a letter. So if it still has been eight months and they get worried, still good. Still within the average time. Thank you, Mary Jane. <laughs> <laughs> I was multitasking. <laughs> yes, I know. Oh, my goodness. Can I ask Mary Jane or maybe Erica a question? Sure. Um, I know the Learning Lab has questions, has students that work on the citizenship questions and tests. Um, how many students are associated with Learning Lab that are working on the citizenship stuff? Or is that a way somebody would normally come in or would they normally come in to learn English and then it would lead to citizenship or what? We, we have both. We have some okay. students that come specifically for citizenship and we have some students that come for English and then it leads to citizenship. Um, we could look up how many have, we keep track of how many become citizens every year. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, do you know Erica in the past year? In the past year, uh, since June, we count from June to June. I think for now we have around 13 mm -hmm. and we were going to have more because there were a lot of interviews coming up, but now everything's canceled. But and Maggie, I don't know if you have come to one of our citizenship parties, but every time, every every fiscal year, we throw a party for all of our students that became citizens that one year. So we still have one pending. You should come. It's very fun. 
Um, I don't know well, if you co covered this, Erica, but I read on the USCIS website today that they're closed here in Boise. On a tentative like opening date is May fourth. Mm. Oh, but it's nice. probably you know who knows. As yeah. everything, they're setting dates and then. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, they've been closed since mid March. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And everything is on hold right now. But hopefully, when they reopen, all the interviews that were canceled will be rescheduled. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. Will be a backlog. Yeah. 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 Well, guys, uh, if you think of any questions, you can always send me an email, and I'm happy. I love this stuff citizenship so you can ask me all the questions you want i love this stuff thank you very much thank you, thank you. and thank you for rehearsing with me or my first zoom meeting ever i think it went well yes, yes. yes. Great. yes. and nobody hacked our meeting or anything so very <laughs> good <laughs> And if you want to learn more, go to uscis.gov and they have everything, okay? All the documents, all the information. They have flashcards, they have videos, they have everything. So it's a great resource, okay? Okay. Okay, great. And, and also, I have a, um, a survey monkey that I'm going to send out this afternoon. If you would take a few minutes to fill it out. That'd be great because we're going to continue to do these trainings um, via Zoom in the near future. Okay. And next great. month we have um, Leela is going to do a training in May. Okay. Cool. One of the things when you first put these notices out that was important to me was that you said um, you get credit for volunteer time for us if we do a Zoom class. Yeah. And I think that's important for people to know. Because, like, I work with Lila on two of her outreach things. So um, I did the second one, even though I'd been to the first one the day before, just to figure I don't have anything to do at home anyhow. And it <laughs> ruined that many volunteer hours. But I know that's important to you guys. So I'm just mentioning it. That's a good thing to mention. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Could I ask it, Maggie, is it, or, or Betty, is it simple to say quickly how you got those lovely backgrounds or if it's... If it's oh, <laughs> yeah, it is. Can I tell you? Yes. Is that okay? You go down at the, at least on a computer, you go down at the bottom of your screen at the lower left. This is only for iPhone, uh, Apple, though. So. Okay. No, I'm, I am on a, a computer at home. I think it's for any computer. Oh. Okay. And you go down to the... Um, there's two up pointy things. The one that's to the right of stop video. Good you job, click, Angie. You click on that one. Mm -hmm. And one of the options you can click on is choose a virtual background. Oh. And if you click on that, um, it'll come up and it'll say choose virtual background. And when you start out, it'll say none. No, but just, you can. Just selected um, the universe here. Huh? I just selected the universe behind that guy in the red shirt. You didn't okay. get the memo. Eric and I have red shirts. You can, you can, upload, you can upload anything I did off my computer oh from my, my God, files and things, upload it into there, and then you have that virtual background. And the only thing I'd say about virtual backgrounds is we started actually before the pandemic. My, my two adult children and, I, and our, my husband, one's in Washington, D.C., and one's in Seattle, and we started doing a family meeting every Thursday night. That's awesome. And we started doing that right after Christmas. They were home for Christmas, and they said, you know, we never see each other, so let's do this. And this is the only thing. So my husband and I, when we do that with the kids, we're on the same screen at home on my computer. And um, we could be on different computers. We just don't do it that way. But it turns out that if you put up a special background, and then you have two people, you tend to get this stuff where it's not a very good picture. You fade in and out. It's kind of like one oh, person yeah. will morph in and one will morph out. And I think it's because with the background there, somehow the, the camera just can't handle it. So that's just And if you look at you mine, happen, that's why. Huh? Mine looks <laughs> weird because there's so much light behind me. I'm yeah. in a room with all windows. And so yeah. it, it does not really <laughs> working. Yeah. But my teeth like look like. I've seen a lot. Of, I've seen a lot of things online lately that are advice for how to do your lighting and what to do for a better Zoom picture. Um, 
I, I've been reading up on those just because I happened to do, actually, <laughs> I had a um, conflict today. I had this for a 12 o'clock Zoom meeting, Zoom meeting, and I had something else I was going to do at Zoom for Zoom at 12 o'clock. And I thought, what a, what a change in lifestyle to have conflicting, <laughs> calendar conflicting two Zoom meetings. Yeah. But anyhow, that's an aside. <laughs> Thank you. This was awesome. Good practice. And Mary Jane, um, you can... Ex exit as all of us or can we just leave one at a time yeah i can just end the meeting and then we're, we're done so okay thank you everybody thanks. have a good week thank you okay bye-bye <laughs> see you soon have a nice weekend bye bye bye, -bye.